it is only man's privilege to be bored. No other animal has the capacity. Why man has the capacity to be bored? It is a byproduct of intelligence. Nothing is wrong about it. Only idiots are not bored, are the enlightened ones. <laughs> but they are few and far in between. The major part of humanity within these two poles of idiots and the enlightened ones, everybody feels more or less bored. Boredom means that you are intelligent enough to see that life is meaningless, that it is just futile to go on living. Nothing comes out of it. It is an effort of making your signature on water, not even on sense, because on sense it may remain for a while before the wind comes and destroys it. It is writing on water. It disappears as it appears, immediately, instantly, and nothing is left behind, not even a smoke. How many millions of people have lived on the earth? What they have left behind? They were also people like you. They were doing everything that you are doing, thinking all kinds of thoughts, dreams, ideas, and they made every effort to be creative, to be fulfilled, to be contented. But what is left? whether they had been or not, makes no difference. If there had been not a single human being before us, it will not make any difference. What difference you are going to make? And if you cannot make any difference, then your life is uncreative. Creativity means making a difference by your being here, leaving the earth not exactly the same as you had found it, that your imprints will always remain there. You may be gone, but what you have created will go on influencing generations after generations. Every man who has ever lived has thought about his life, that what does it signify? Or is it just vegetating? No animal is bored because no animal is bothered about meaning. No animal is concerned about creativity. A buffalo chewing grass is as contented as any Gautam the Buddha. She is not aware of her contentment, that is the difference, but she is perfectly contented. No tomorrow, no yesterday. 
no problems. Just watch a buffalo chewing grass. And you can see the difference between man and animal. The man may be sitting on a golden throne. That does not make any difference. Or he may be a beggar. But they both are immensely concerned that why they are here, for what? Is it just accidental? Or there is some destiny to it? This question remains unanswered, hence the boredom. You cannot find in anything contentment, blissfulness, meaning. You see every day passing by, and you know the death is coming closer, 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 and life is not yielding anything. Your hands are empty. Strangely, when a child is born, he is born with closed hands, as if he is bringing something into life. When the man dies, he dies with open hands. All is lost. There is nothing to hold into the fists. There is no need for fists. No man has ever died with fists closed. And no child has ever born with fists open. It is significant. Physiologically it has different meanings. Because the child is not yet capable is strong enough to open the hands. That's why physiologically they are, they are not fists, because the child simply cannot open the hands. Physiologically that is the explanation that he cannot open the hands, yet he needs a little strength, then he can open the hands. And the man dying gets his whole body relaxed. Death is the ultimate relaxant. The whole life he was tense. Now life is leaving the body. The body was not tense, it was the life in it. The intelligence, the mind, that was making it tense. Now fist is a tense a state of the hands. When life leaves the body, even if you are holding the fist, it, it is bound to happen that your fist will open up. Because now there is no more energy to keep the fist closed. The child had no more energy to open it up. The old man has no more energy to keep it closed. It needs a strength to keep it closed. That is a physiological explanation. But the metaphor is beautiful. And I am mentioning it as a metaphor. Every child is born with the idea that there is going to be something great. Every child comes with hope, ambition, desire, and a confidence that all this is going to materialize, that his dreams are not going to remain dreams, they will become realities. To me, that is the metaphor of his closed fist. 
He is coming with a treasure, with a secret. He is not coming without a message. He is coming with a message to be fulfilled. He is coming with a destiny. Hence, children are not bored. They may cry, they may weep, they may laugh, they may smile, but you cannot find babies to be bored. They have not yet felt that life is not what it is supposed to be. They have not experienced life made with the same stuff as dreams. It needs a little growth, a little experience, and the more intelligent a child is, sooner he becomes bored. The stupid ones take a little longer time, obviously, because to see the meaninglessness of life, you need a very sharp intelligence. You ask me, do I ever feel bored? Not now. For 21 years of my life's beginning, I don't think any one of you has felt as much boredom as I have felt. Perhaps I finished the quota. <laughs> there is a limit to everything. My parents were puzzled. I never participated in any games. If I make a joke of football today, it is not new. I have been making jokes of all games as long as I can remember. I have never participated in any game, any play. My teachers were concerned. My parents were concerned that what kind of a child you are and what you go on doing. You go out and play. I said to them that every parent is telling to their children, come in and study, <laughs> and you all go and forcing me go out and play. Who is strange? I am strange or you are strange. And I don't see any point in playing. I don't see any outcome of it, just wasting time. Those who have time, they can waste. I don't have much time. The day my maternal grandfather died, death became a constant companion with me. I was only seven years when he died. He died in my lap. He used to live in a faraway village and I used to live with him. I lived with my maternal grandfather and my maternal grandmother. They had no other child than my mother. And my mother was too young when I was born. And she had the whole responsibility of the family because my father's mother died when I was only two years old. My father's brothers and sisters were too small, too young. My mother was also too young. So she has to take care of the whole family. So my maternal grandfather and mother decided that it would be better that I live with them. I will have more freedom and they can take more care of me 
and my mother will be a little less burdened. So she can take care of her husband's family. Now she is the oldest, although she was just a young girl. The village was not very far away, only 16 miles, but no road, no train. And when my grandfather fell sick, and the only physician in the village said that it is beyond me, you take him immediately to some hospital. So he took him in a bullock cart because there was no other way. Those 16 miles looked like thousands of miles because he was dying. I could see his pulse was slowing down. He was becoming unable to open his eyes. He started breathing in a very strange way. He stopped speaking. I saw death coming closely, closely, and he was in my lap because my grandmother was so much in misery and suffering that she was constantly crying. I told her that you should think of me. I am only a child. Now I am to take care of the dying man and to take care of you and you had brought me to take care of me. <laughs> this seems strange. You at least don't cry because if you cry then how can I stop myself from crying? I am not crying just because so that you can stop. But she was not in her senses. And I continuously was watching in every possible way whether the man is still alive or gone. And I saw him slowly, slowly, slowly drowning. By the time we reached my father's place, he was dead. After that, death became a constant companion to me. That day I also died. Because one thing became certain, that whether you live seven years or seventy years, he was seventy years, what does it matter? You have to die. And he was a rare man because I could not conceive him telling a lie, breaking a promise. Even judging somebody as bad, I remember one night in the village there was no police station, no police, nothing. And he was the richest man in the village. A thief entered and I used to sleep with him in his bed. He saw the thief entering, crossing the fencing. He started telling me a story. The thief had entered in the house and he was sitting in the corner. He started telling me a story. It seems the thief also became interested in what is story. <laughs> <laughs> and he had the habit, just like Taru, of chewing pan, <laughs> the beetle leaf, continuously. <laughs> His bag was always with him, very beautiful bag. <laughs> and he was continuously making his pan and he will chew the pan and spit on the thief. <laughs> he was sitting in the pan. <laughs> and the thief could not escape either <laughs> because he will be caught. <laughs> and he could not say that you are destroying my whole clothes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> Finally, it was too much, and the thief said, <laughs> because I used to call him Nana, Nana means maternal grandfather, because of me, the old man had become Nana of the whole village. Everybody started calling him Nana. So the thief said, Nana, it is too much. <laughs> I am enjoying your story, but I cannot enjoy your pun. <laughs> you please stop, you will spoil my whole dress. He said, tomorrow you can come and take new clothes from me, because I have deliberately spitting on you. It is not good of me, I should not have done it. But the man said, I am a thief and you know, I had come to steal. He said, that is your business, whether you are a thief or not. But tomorrow you come and take new clothes, because he had a shop, a multi-purpose shop. In small villages there are only multi-purpose shops, one shop, clothes, sweets, everything available, shoes, umbrellas. <laughs> There was no other shop, he had the only shop for everything the village needed, medicines. Next day the thief came and I asked him that you seem to have some nerve. You have come with his whole shirt and dhoti spoiled red. He said, what else to do, because I am a poor man, I cannot afford another dress. And Nana has promised, and he is a man of promise. I said, you are certain he can collect the neighborhood, can get you caught, because you had entered in the house with the intention of stealing, you have accepted it. Otherwise, what you were doing here? And he has left all these marks on you <laughs> as a proof. He said, you don't create doubt in me. I know your Nana. Even if I had stolen, I have not stolen anything because I had no chance. <laughs> he will never say anybody and he went and he got new dress and asked my Nana that this seems to be a little going too far. Don't let him be caught. Okay, don't judge him as a thief, but you are rewarding. He said, no, I am not rewarding, I have spoiled his clothes. I am simply replacing what I have spoiled and he has not stolen. Intentions are just intentions. Mm. And even if he had stolen, what is wrong in it? Because in this whole village everybody is poor, only I am rich. So if something they take away, it belongs to them. From where I have got all my riches? From these poor people. They work for me, they work in my farm, they work in my garden. Everything that I have, I don't produce anything, I don't go to work in the field to cut the crop or anything. All these people do. And then if once in a while somebody steals, they are stealing their own thing. I am not concerned in it. And he told me, don't think about that man as a thief. That is not your business. And we enjoyed it. It was such a great entertainment. I said, that is true that we both enjoyed seeing him. He went on slipping into the corner, but more he was in the corner, more he was caught. He wanted to escape from the juice of the beetle leaf, <laughs> but he could not get out because that corner was just close to my grandfather's bed. 
it was dark there. So he was thinking that it was just accidental in the beginning, but when he started <laughs> slipping away and the spit also started coming to the corner, then finally he thought it is not accidental. That old man is just <laughs> spitting just like a good shot. <laughs> and the story he is telling is just to make me aware that he is awake. It will not be easy to steal anything. So finally, I had to declare myself that I am here and suffering, and now I stop and let me go. He was such a good man, and always nice and helpful to everybody. Whoever came to him, he was helping. He will give money to people. They had come for loan. They wanted to put something as mortgage, but he never accepted anything in mortgage. He said, I don't know, tomorrow I may die. Then who will give you this mortgage back? You take the money. If you can manage to give it back, good. If you cannot manage, Nothing to be worried. I have enough. He never took their, those people's signatures that they have taken money. I asked him that you should have their signatures that they have loaned money. He said, it is not loan, it is their money. And they may be thinking it is a loan, I am not thinking it as a loan. So if they return, good. If they don't return, there is no loss, because I was never expecting them to return. And they are so poor from where they are going to return. Such a good man and beautiful man simply died what was the meaning of his life? That became a torturous question to me. What was the meaning? What he attained? Seventy years he lived the life of a good man. But what is the point of it all? It simply ended. Not even a dress is left behind. His death made me immensely serious. I was serious even before his death. By the age four I started thinking of problems that people somehow managed to go on postponing to the very end. I don't believe in postponing. I started asking questions to my maternal grandfather, and he will say, these questions, the whole life is there. There is no hurry, and you are too young. I said, I have seen young boys dying in the village. They had not asked these questions. They have died without finding the answer. Can you guarantee me that I will not die tomorrow or day after tomorrow? Can you give me the guarantee that I will die only after I have found the answer? He said, I cannot guarantee, because death is not in my hands, neither life is in my hands. Then I said, you should not suggest me any postponement. I want the answer now. If you know, then say that you know and give me the answer. If you don't know, then don't feel awkward in accepting your ignorance. Soon he realized that with me there is no other alternative. Either you have to say yes, but it is not easy then, then you have to 
go into deeper details about it. And you cannot deceive. He started accepting his ignorance that I don't know. And I said, you are too old. Soon you will be dying. What have you been doing your whole life? At the moment of death, you will have only ignorance in your hands and nothing else. And these are vital questions. I am not asking you any trivia. You go to the temple, I ask you why you go to the temple. Have you found anything in the temple? You have been going your whole life. And you try to persuade me to come along with you to the temple. The temple was made by him. One day he accepted that the truth is because I have made the temple. Even if I don't go there, then who is going to go there? But to you, I accept it that it is futile. I have been going there my whole life. I have not gained anything. Then I said, try something else. Don't die with the question. Die with the answer. But he died with the question. The last time he spoke to me, almost ten hours before he died, he opened his eyes and he said, You were right. Postponing is not right. And I am dying with all the questions with me. So remember, whatever <coughs> I was suggesting to you was wrong. You were right. Don't postpone. If a question arises, try to find the answer as quickly as possible. And there are thousand and one questions. Every child asks you. And just because you are such a coward that you cannot accept your ignorance, you go on giving him bogus answers. He asks you, who created the world? And you answer him without knowing anything about God, that God created the world, without even being feeling a saint. No change on your face. You answer as if you know it. But you don't know you are deceiving. And you are deceiving not only the child, you are also deceiving yourself. It works both the ways. If you succeed in deceiving the child, you have succeeded in deceiving yourself that perhaps you know. And again and again <coughs> telling to people that God created the world, you will start believing in your own life. Then certainly you will not feel so bored. Lies are very interesting. Because they are your inventions. The search for truth goes through much boredom. It is not an entertainment. Somebody has asked a question that why people are so much disinterested in the discovery of truth. It is not far to seek the answer. Even to raise the question about truth it means you have to become serious. 
it means you are losing the world of entertainment behind of circuses movies carnivals football matches you are leaving all that world which keeps people occupied and you are moving into the opposite direction of entertainment that is boredom why people are engaged in all these entertainments just to avoid being bored just watch yourself one day left alone in the house and you start doing bizarre things you will turn the radio on then put it off then you will turn the tv on not that you are really interested but what else to do just left alone boredom starts descending on you you will start phoning to friends that would you like to come or i can come or we can meet <laughs> in zorba the buddha <laughs> he is bored you are bored two bored persons is it is interesting <laughs> start entertaining each other as far as i can see this is absolutely against arithmetic i don't know much arithmetic <laughs> from the very beginning in my school i heard these three r's the whole education consists of three r's one of my teachers said reading writing arithmetic <laughs> i said <laughs> whom you are trying to be full arithmetic <laughs> just to manage to make it three r's you are changing arithmetic into arithmetic I told him education consists only of two hours reading and writing. <laughs> Arithmetic I don't take in. <laughs> and I have never been at ease with that arithmetic. <laughs> But this much i can understand that two bored persons meeting together will make the boredom double <laughs> that's what happens in marriages <laughs> all around the world everybody knows both were alone and were feeling bored they started entertaining each other and immediately they fall into the fallacy that being together life will be interesting there will be some juice in it but it is possible only when you meet the girl or the boy on the sea beach waiting 23 hours for one hour is stolen kisses are sweet otherwise <laughs> how kisses can be sweet <laughs> it is stealing that makes them sweet i don't see that kisses can be sweet <laughs> particularly french kisses <laughs> If French kisses are sweet, every French will be suffering from diabetes. <laughs> so much sugar, <laughs> and there is no sugar at all. The diabetic people can kiss without any fear. <laughs> But it's stolen. There is sweetness. that you are creating a small world of your own but 
meeting once in a while, you both are prepared, you both are ready. You have taken a shower, she has taken a shower, <laughs> and for at least three hours she has been before the mirror <laughs> and used all kinds of perfumes and deodorants and lipstick <laughs> and what not. <laughs> and then you meet for a few minutes or an hour. Of course, you both are far away. Only your personalities, the masks that she has come with painted smiles and you have come with painted smiles. The strangest thing is that you know that you are not what you are pretending to be. She knows she is not what she is pretending to be, but both believe that the other is exactly what the other is. This is something unbelievable. And then naturally they want to live together. If one hour is so sweet, <laughs> if one hour is so miraculous that all boredom disappears, and they start imagining how beautiful it will be to be together twenty-four hours. And the fallacy has continued all along history. And I don't see any possibility that it is going to stop even in the future. If it stops, it will be far significant, meaningful, and will give you a chance to understand the boredom. Because by understanding it, you can go beyond it. By avoiding it, you remain trapped into it. Marriage is a way to avoid it, just as there are so many other ways. But as you are twenty-four hours together, how long you can pretend? Pretension needs tremendous effort, energy. One day, two day, three day, and the honeymoon is over and your mask starts slipping and you don't care anymore even if it slips and falls down because the girl's mask is also slipping. I have heard one man got married to a woman. They went to the honeymoon. The man said that before we go to the bed, this is my old habit to put the light off. It is just such a deep-rooted habit that I cannot go to bed unless I put the light off the room. He said, this is a stage. You can go to bed. I am coming from the bathroom and I will put the light off. He said, then I will wait outside the bed. But the woman insisted, unless you go into bed, this is my habit, <laughs> that I will go into the bathroom and come out only if you have gone to bed. The man said, this is strange. From the very beginning there is a conflict of habits. The man said, now there is no point. The truth is that I don't have real legs. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot undress in the light. The woman said, then it is okay, because I don't have breasts. <laughs> you can undress in the light, I can undress in the light. I was afraid that you may discover that I don't have any breasts. The man said, my oh God, I was afraid that you will discover that my legs are false. But the marriage is already on the rocks. The honeymoon has not even started. The light is still on. <laughs> Every honeymoon, more or less, in different ways, ends in the same way.
once you have known the woman, her physiology, topography, she has known you, your great love making, huffing and puffing <laughs> and perspiring and stinking. <laughs> now you know you are going to bore each other as much first, at least you were alone and bored. Now you are bored and somebody else is also to bore you. <laughs> then husband and wife go on living in eternal happiness afterwards. <laughs> That's how every story ends, every film ends after that. They lived in eternal happiness. After that they did not live at all. <laughs> They simply died, every day died more and more. But man's stupidity is such that he won't see the exact problem. He will think, this woman failed me, this man failed me. Perhaps we are not meant for each other, as if there is some woman who is meant for you, some man who is meant for you, forgive me, there is nobody. <laughs> Just nobody is meant for you. You are born alone and you have to accept your aloneness. Sooner you do, the better. But aloneness is boredom because there is no entertainment, nothing interesting. Yes, for twenty-one years I was bored to death. Not only that I was bored, I was boring everybody whom I could catch hold of. My father will start immediately looking into his books, and I had seen him that he was sitting, not looking in the book. As I entered, he started looking. I said, why you are trying to look busy without business? I have seen you, you were just sitting. There is no customer. And you were not looking in the books. Why you started looking in the books? He said, can't I even allow myself to be engaged into something to avoid you? You go somewhere else. You must be bringing some problems. I have my own troubles. You take care of your own problems. My teachers will not allow me to raise my hand. <laughs> because that was, I don't know, in other countries what it happens, but in India it is, if you have to ask a question, you have to raise your hand. <laughs> my practice was, before the teacher entered in the class, <laughs> He has not even got seated and my hand is up and he will say, this is something, at least let me sit down. Is there some emergency? I said, everything is emergency. And why I should waste time? And when you start teaching, then you force me to keep my hand down because you are teaching and I should not disturb. And they will immediately start writing on the board so they can keep their back towards me. But I was not so easy. Just the other day we were talking about Bible basing. I was book basing. I will go on keeping the book till he will have to turn. I said, you cannot escape this way. My hand is up. And I have a question. And all kinds of questions. And he will say, for example, this question does not belong to my subject. I said, it is not a question of subject. 
लाइफ कैन नॉट बी डिवाइडेड इन टू सब्जेक्ट योर स्कूल करिकुलम मे बी डिवाइडेड बट लाइफ इज अनडिवाइडेड वेन आई गो इन द हिस्ट्री क्लास आई एम द सेम पर्सन वेन आई गो इन टू द जोग्राफी क्लास आई एम द सेम पर्सन विद द सेम प्रॉब्लम आई गो इन टू एवरी क्लास सो आई डोंट बादर अबाउट वट सब्जेक्ट यू आर टीचिंग आई एम कंसर्न विथ माई क्वेश्चन and my question is not only my question it is yours too and that's what is freaking you out <laughs> and simple question that what is the meaning of your life why you are living no teacher <laughs> said what do you want you should commit suicide I said i have no objection <laughs> But before you commit suicide, you will have to answer me why you are committing suicide. What you are going to gain out of it? That question you will have to answer. So suicide is not going to help. The question will remain the same: Why you are living? Why you are dying? And if you can't answer such a simple question that why you are living, then what else? You try to teach me history. about alexander the great and you don't know anything about you even about your life you want to teach me about religion krishna and rama and you don't know anything about the living principle in you from where you got it are you aware of the source and where you are going once you are is skeptical then everything can become the object of immensely important questions and when you are surrounded by questions and no answer is coming from anywhere you feel betrayed by existence betrayed by your parents betrayed by your teachers betrayed by your priests because there is no answer and you go on living and committing a suicide is a crime a strange world just the other day a news cutting was brought to me that one man died near the white house in washington hungry frozen in cold just by the wall of the white house and when they found in the morning the dead body they search and it was found that that man was a second world war veteran can you believe this that they gave him all the respects that are to be given to a war veteran alive he was hungry with no clothes to cover him from the cold nobody bothered dead with great respect with all military respect he was given the salute what kind of world we are living in a living person has no means to live and a dead person is given great honors in the same way it is so funny that suicide all over the world is one of the greatest crime it's strange you don't help people to find the meaning of their life and you force them to live because to drop out of living to just return the ticket back and say that i want to get out of this train of life i am no more interested 
you are committing a crime. And the thing becomes more funnier if you are caught committing suicide, then you will be sentenced to death. <laughs> we are living with such intelligent people all around, the great lawmakers, constitution makers. That's exactly what he was going to do. Now, what is the need of all this hullabaloo <laughs> that catch hold of him, then in, for months keep him into the prison, then the court trial, and then the advocates fighting each other like cats and dogs, and the great magistrate sitting seriously, deciding, and after that the man is sentenced to death and the man, poor man was doing it himself without any expenses to the government, to the nation, to anybody. That was crime. Why suicide is crime? From my very early age I have been thinking why suicide is a crime. It is a crime because it gives the idea to everybody else also that life is not worth living, that man did well. You are not courageous enough, you are cowardly, you cannot commit suicide. How to hide this cowardliness? Of course you can make a law that he has committed a crime. And this kind of crime has to be prevented, otherwise many more people will start committing. They are really trying to repress the idea of dropping out of life from everybody's mind. It is a well-known, well-established fact that anybody with a little intelligence thinks in his life at least one time certainly that is the minimum to commit suicide. Why? Because life seems to be just boredom. Marriage has failed. Religion has failed. Politics leads nowhere. You can have all the money in the world is still you are as poor as you were before. Boredom is something very fundamental. It is part of not accepting your aloneness. It is part of not being able to enjoy your aloneness. You have been taught by the society just to escape Go on running, don't look back, but the boredom follows you like the shadow, it is your shadow. Where are you going to escape? You can't escape from it. Perhaps for a few moments in alcohol you can drown it, but next day morning it will come back worse than it was before, then you call it hangover. <laughs> you suffer the hangover, still again you are going to drink, knowing perfectly well the hangover is coming, but at least for a few hours you are absent. Drunkards, are not bored. You can go into any pub and see the drunkards. They are utterly happy and enjoying, shouting, screaming, beating, doing all kinds of things. But they are radiant. You will not 
see them miserable sitting in a corner philosophically like Rodin's statue of the thinker <laughs> with the hands half closed eyes the thinker has a posture the very posture shows sadness Rodin's statue of a thinker has exactly caught the mood of boredom that he is so bored has no energy even to open his eyes and look around inside questions upon questions are standing in a row endless row one marriage fails people start getting divorces searching another woman i have heard about one californiac <laughs> yes i use the word californiac because that kind of people you can find only in california whoever gave the name california to this part of the world must have in mind the idea of californiac <laughs> one californiac married eight times nothing surprising in america <laughs> in india of course the wives go on praying to find the same husband in the next life <laughs> <laughs> and i have always felt so sorry for the poor husband if these <laughs> prayers are heard every year there is a particular day in india see fast on that day the married woman and after fasting she prays that is purification then the prayer that she should get the same husband life after life <laughs> i feel sorry for the poor husband because if these prayers are heard what is going to happen to him and i feel very strange about the women that are they aware what they are asking <laughs> this dodo <laughs> life after life one life is not enough but just traditionally in fact every day they are a pain in the neck of the dodo <laughs> and the same dodo goes on to into them everybody in this instance follows jesus christ do unto others whatever you want to be done to you by them husband is doing to the wife what he wants to be done to him the wife is doing what she wants to be done to her all are christians in that way particularly married couples are all christians to whatever religion they belong this man married eight times and each time he found that somehow he ends up with the same type of woman must have been a little alert man <laughs> he watched that this is a strange but this is not a strange it is a simple psychology you fall in love with a woman you have certain ideas about beauty form aesthetics and that woman fits in your formula who is going to be the right wife for you as if right wives exist or right husbands exist all are wrong because the whole institution of marriage is idiotic so no right husband no right wife 
unless somebody like me manages marriage of two persons. For example, I know one couple would have been the right couple. Murarji Desai, ex-Prime Minister of India and Mother Teresa. <laughs> I can say with absolute certainty that if they were married, that would be the perfect couple of the whole history. But it is very difficult to find. It took fifty years for me to discover <laughs> one couple. <laughs> because you choose a woman, you forget the thing that you have a certain formula unconsciously working. Why you suddenly choose a woman? There are so many women in the world. Because this woman fits with your idea of a right wife. Now, you divorce after three months because you found it that her nose fits with the formula, her hair color fits with the formula, her body fits with the formula, but she is not only a combination of hair, eyes, nose. These are nothing. She is an individual hidden from you completely. So you have only seen the outer side of the woman and you don't know her inner depths where she really is and she has seen your outer form. It is just like seeing the fence you decide this is the right house. And you have only seen the fence around the house, not even the walls of the house. What to say about the inner chambers and what is there, scorpions or <laughs> snakes, witches and devils, who never knows what is there. Just the fence fits. But you can't live outside the fence. You get married just to go inside the house. <laughs> And when you enter into each other's house, it is terrible. <laughs> because you both have chosen each other out of boredom, not out of joy. You have chosen not to share something, but to get something. The woman has also chosen to get something because she is empty. Now two beggars are choosing each other thinking that the other is an emperor. Once you come closer, dreams are broken. You can divorce the woman, but how you are going to choose another woman? Again, the old formula that you know, that is fixed in your unconscious, perhaps you are not aware of it. The old formula will find the same kind of woman again. You cannot find anybody else. It is almost marrying the same woman. And that's what happened. That's why I was going to tell the story. That eight women he married. When he married the seventh woman, he found after two days that once before also he had married her. <laughs> It took two days to discover him that it looks almost, they were all similar types, but this one looks exactly a replica. And the woman was not yet aware that it is the same man. When he told her, then she became aware. They said, my God, what we have done? So let us be two, three months together again and divorce. Wherever divorce has come as a fashion, it is bound to be found that you will always choose the same type and the other woman on the other side is going to choose the same type of man. You 
perhaps are not doing anything different than the Hindu wife. You are going into unnecessary trouble of changing the wife and husband and house and job and going through courts and... Hindus have discovered it long before that it is pointless, you will choose again the same woman, she will choose again the same husband, so why not decide once forever that we are going to be eternal companions, torturing each other. What is the point of changing? At least we will become accustomed of each other's torture. Perhaps we may start loving it, each other's torture. Just one needs a little practice and one starts loving any kind of thing. And practice for lives together. I think Hindus have some insight in it. That why practice again with another? It is better to have the old companion, you know perfectly well, she knows you perfectly well. There is no need to start everything from A, B, C. You can start from X, Y, Z. <laughs> there is no need for honeymoon, that's why Hindus don't go for a honeymoon, you know. There is nothing like honeymoon in India. What is the point? Because this woman has been your wife for many lives before. <laughs> and she is going to be your wife many So why waste time? Why waste money? I have heard about a very miserly Christian who was going to a hill station. Just in the train somebody sitting by his side asked, where are you going? He said, I'm going on my honeymoon. The man said, but I don't see your wife. <laughs> he said, she will be going next year. <laughs> because it is too much expensive, two persons <laughs> going together. <laughs> so this time I'm going, next year she will be going. I think that too is insightful. At least they will not destroy their honeymoon. People are doing all kinds of things for the simple reason that they can forget themselves. Because the moment they remember themselves, there is boredom. And the whole society, all cultures teach you to escape quickly from yourself. Further away the better. I was also bored, but one thing I did different, and that was that I decided I am going to live with this boredom. I am not going to escape, because escape is not going to hell. And you will be surprised how I have lived my boredom. My family, my friends started thinking that I have gone mad because I will not participate in any entertainment, I will not go for any picnic. What I will do, I will lie down on the floor and look at the ceiling for hours together. Just to be bored as much as possible. Now there is nothing. And you don't know Indian ceiling. <laughs> you can't find anything more ugly. <laughs> Just ugly beams. covered with mud tiles, full of dirt, spider webs, rats running on the beams, and I will simply lie down on the floor looking 
at this beautiful scene. I had decided that whatever is boredom, I am determined to live with it. If this is how nature wanted me to be alone, then, okay, let nature take its own course. But the strangest thing happens with my determination to live with boredom. One day it disappears. I was there alone, but no more lonely. And since then it has not appeared again. Right now I have almost forgotten how it tastes. You have asked the question, so I am trying to answer you. But my own experience has fallen so far away that I can describe it but I feel that I don't have really its psychological memory. These two words will be helpful to understand factual memory and psychological memory. Thirty years before you insulted me and I was angry. I can remember it factually that you insulted me and I was angry. This is factual memory. But to get into that anger again, to have that insult become a real thing again, not as a memory but as a living experience, then it is psychological memory. I have lost the psychological track of all memories. Factually I can describe, but I cannot relive. My life is absolutely lonely. It is a strange to state because I have lived my whole life, 35 years, in crowds. But I am alone in the crowds. You are there, but I am alone. Even in the crowds, I am not in any way different than when I am sitting in my room alone. My aloneness persists. It is incorruptible. I live almost in one room the whole day. My life is as much a routine as possible. Everything that creates boredom, I have meticulously arranged around myself. I have not allowed anything that may help me to escape from my aloneness. In the morning exact I get up and do you know what I do? The first thing even Vivek does not know. <laughs> the first thing is I pinch myself to see <laughs> whether I am still here. <laughs> it is finished. <laughs> Only after pinching myself and being certain, then I push the button <laughs> for Vivek to bring my tea. Because what is the point pushing the button? <laughs> He will unnecessarily get up and prepare the tea and bring it, and that is not right. So first I make certain that I am still here. Then the second thing I do, 
I pushed the button for her to bring my tea. And what is my tea? No milk, <laughs> no sugar, <laughs> just hot water <laughs> with tea leaves. But I enjoy it <laughs> because it is the purest taste of tea. Sugar and milk destroy the purity of tea completely. Everything is set up exactly every day. Then half hour in my bathroom, then half hour in my swimming pool. It must be the hottest swimming pool in the world, <laughs> 99 centigrade degrees. <laughs> it is just cooking yourself completely. 20 minutes in it and you are cooked well. <laughs> and I don't have a small swimming pool, Olympic size. <laughs> You know, I am a man of very simple tastes. <laughs> I am satisfied with the best of anything. <laughs> Simply satisfied, but with the best of anything. Sila was asking me, what you are going to do with the Olympic size? I said, that is not the point. <laughs> but what I am going to do with Olympic size? Size has to be the Olympic size. I cannot step in a smaller size swimming pool. Half an hour in that hot water, then back half an hour under ice cold sour. You cannot have that ice cold sour more than for two minutes. But after 99 degrees of hot water. It is a tremendously beautiful experience. <laughs> <laughs> to be under ice cold water. The change from the hot to the opposite to the very cold is again a deeper pinching. <laughs> First was on the body, this is on the soul. <laughs> then I am perfectly certain that I am here and going to prevail at least today. <laughs> Vivek brings my breakfast, which is really a great breakfast. <laughs> Just a glass of juice, the same. <laughs> it is the same for everybody, but not for me, because I don't compare. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow has not come yet. I don't compare it. Vivek was asking me today, are you really excited? Because yesterday I said, I am excited. <laughs> she was asking me, are you really excited? <laughs> I said, I'm always <laughs> excited with the same juice, <laughs> same food, because the problem arises only when you start comparing. When you start thinking that for ten years you have been having the same juice, then there arises <laughs> a fear that, what are you doing? But I am not bored. I have dropped comparison. I don't carry any psychological memory with me. I go on dropping it moment to moment. And then I can enjoy the same thing for the whole eternity. She must have been worried because I talked she must have talked with my personal physician, Devraj, <laughs> that should we change Bhagwan's complete menu? I said, no, I am not going to allow you to change it. 
I am so settled with it that the change may create some trouble. And I am not bored with it. It is difficult to believe But I have learned one thing, that if you can enjoy your aloneness, then you can enjoy anything. And if you cannot enjoy your aloneness, you cannot enjoy anything. That is something absolutely fundamental principle. I had a friend who is a school inspector and one day he came very excited to me and said, just listen, can't you believe it? I said, you just sit down, don't be so excited, what has happened? I never see you excited, you are almost bored and the same routine, going again and again to the same schools and same classes and same questions. What has happened? Something extraordinary? He said, you cannot believe it. I went to a school. First I have to explain you the story, otherwise you won't follow him. Sita's father, Sita is Rama's wife, his father has declared that whosoever breaks the bow of Shiva that Shiva himself had given him as a gift, my daughter will put the garland on his neck. That was called Swayambara in India. The girl choosing her husband by a certain device. This was the device, and the device was really difficult. The Shiva's bow was so heavy that to break it by hand was almost impossible. It was difficult even to pick it up by your hand from the platform, it was lying down. Princes after princes, kings after kings came. Finally Rama came and he broke Shiva's bow and married Sita. This story was given to the students of a class to prepare for tomorrow. And that was the day by accident he happened to visit the school and when he entered this class the teacher was just asking the students that tell me who broke Shiva's bow. A boy, very afraid and nervous, raised his hand. <laughs> the teacher was surprised because this was the last boy who he, he would have imagined that he will answer. He had never answered anything. But now he was raising the hand and the principal was there and the inspector of his schools was there. So he said, okay, he was afraid that he is going to mess the whole thing. <laughs> and the boy stood up and said, he said, sir, I have not broken it. <laughs> and moreover, yesterday I had not come to the school even. Now he has really messed the whole thing. <laughs> the teacher was boiling hard. What the inspector will think, what the principal will think. But before he could say anything or do anything, the principal said, as far as I think, this boy seems to be mischievous. I think he has broken it. <laughs> the inspector was at a loss. What to do now? <laughs> this is going absolutely mad. <laughs> He went to the chairman of the school committee to tell that what is going on. 
and the chairman said, you don't be worried. I will just tell the carpenter and he will... <laughs> children are children and furniture gets broken. There is nothing to be worried. I said, but you should have enjoyed. It was such a beautiful experience. But you don't seem to have enjoyed it. You have become worried about it. He said, worried? It is a great concern. What is going on? The headmaster even says that, I suspect this is the culprit. His face shows it. And the chairman says, don't be worried. I will tell the carpenter and he will fix it. This is an everyday affair. These children are children. And he said, this is not the holy story. When I came home, I told my wife and my wife said that you will come to your senses or not. In our house, so many things are broken and nobody bothers. I have been telling you, the chair is broken. The lamp is broken. And you are worrying about Siva's bow. What business it is yours? So I have come to you to tell that this is the state of affairs. I think this is a very beautiful state of affairs. Just go and enjoy. But don't get worried about it. The beauty of the story could not have been better if he had simply answered factually that Rama broke the bow. What was there? But the boy was original. <laughs> he said, my God, you say the boy was original. I, said, I think everybody was original because they all managed to find some new idea. They were not repeating old things. To repeat old things becomes boring. The way to get out of it are to either don't repeat old things, which is impossible. Because life consists of small things. You will have to brush your teeth every day. How many original ways you can find? <laughs> I don't see. As far as my dentist is concerned, there is only one right way. <laughs> wrong ways you can find, but the right way is only one. If you start getting bored with that, then every morning you will start bored. Enjoy it. Don't compare. What is there to compare? If you don't compare, it is no more repetition. If you compare, it is repetition. You will have to take a shower and it is going to be the same. You will use the clothes and you will do the work. It is all going to be the same, more or less. If you try everything new in order to be creative, you will simply go crazy. This story of Siva's bow reminds me of another that happened in front of me, in my own village. The same story, Rama's life is played all over India every year. And this part comes, Ramana, who is the competitor of Rama, and he is a mighty man. And he was also as much a devotee of Siva as Sita's father, perhaps a bigger devotee. So it was a great fear that he may break and neither Sita's father wanted because he was a monstrous man with ten heads. Mm -hmm.
Sita was afraid that he may. Everybody was afraid. So a conspiracy was created. The moment he stands up and goes towards the bow, a man comes running in and said, Your kingdom is on fire. Sri Lanka was his kingdom. And the story is that his capital in Sri Lanka was made of all gold. Of course, if his kingdom is on fire, he dropped the idea. He had already many wives and he was not very much particularly interested in Sita. The only thing was the challenge to break the bow. He was interested in breaking the bow. Sita and no Sita was not the problem. He had many beautiful wives. So he rushed towards Lanka. Meanwhile, Rama broke the bow, got married. This is the story. And then the story goes on. What happened in my village when the scene comes and the man comes running in and says, Ramana, your kingdom is on fire. He said, let it be. <laughs> Near about 20,000 people, many of whom were asleep just <laughs> The whole crowd was awake. And what has happened? <laughs> Ramana said, let it be. <laughs> this time I am going to break this Seva's book. Every year the same, the same, the same. Your kingdom is on fire and nothing is on fire. <laughs> And he broke the bow. The bow was nothing, it was just a bamboo bow. He just broke it in many pieces and threw all the pieces away and told the father of Sita, bring the girl, bring it. it was a great shock, but really original. And he declared to the people, now you go home. <laughs> the story is finished. Because that's the problem in the Holy Story. Rama gets married to Sita, then Ramana finds the conspiracy that the kingdom is not fire, is not on fire, and it was just a trick to take him out and to give time to Rama. He steals Sita just to take revenge. Then the Holy Story goes on, he steals Sita, then Rama fights and gets Sita back. But he finished the Holy Story. He said, it is finished. You can go home and from tomorrow there is no Ram Leela. For this year I have done it. And later on it was found that the problem was he had a quarrel with the manager who was managing the show. Because after the show they all used to get sweets and fruits which people were bringing to offer to Rama, all the actors used to get it. And yesterday he got a little a smaller proportion and he was angry and he was saying, today I want double. And the manager said, no, nothing doing. <laughs> if I give you double, then everybody else will ask double. He said, then mind. If something goes wrong, I am not responsible. The manager says, what can go wrong? He had never conceived that this man <laughs> can do this. I went back to the stage and I really appreciated the man. I said, you did something original every year. Somebody needs to do something original. The manager said, you are supporting him. We are going to give him to the police because he has destroyed the whole thing. Now, tomorrow from where we are going to start the story? Tickets have been sold. People will ask their money back if the story is finished. And it was just a beginning day. We are going to give him to the police. I said, no, that is not right. He is an original person. Tomorrow you find somebody else to play the role, just release him from the role and start again from the very beginning. 
But he said, how to his stand? Because he has broken the book. I said, simple, just tomorrow open the soul, declare the soul will be there, and it will be the first soul. And Janak, the father of Sita, when the curtain opens, will declare that yesterday, by the mistake of my servants, the real bow of Shiva was left in the palace, and this was just a bow with children play with, which was broken. Today, now the real bow is there, and the soul starts. The manager said, that's good, that, that will do. And the soul started next day, and people were laughing, because again it was a bamboo bow, and if somebody wants to break it, he can break it. But that Ramana was taken out, there was somebody else who was playing the role. And the story continued, and people felt asleep and snowed. <laughs> but in life you cannot be original every moment. But what can be done, and what has happened to me, is the moment I started enjoying just being myself, all psychological memory goes on falling like dust every day. And anything, because it is not compared with the past, is new, is original. I see you. I never feel that these are the same people. Not for a single moment, because twenty-four hours have passed. You have all grown twenty-four hours older. So much water in the Ganges has gone down. It is no more the same water. So much life has flown through you. You are not the same person. Yes, the same face, similar, but not exactly the same. Gautam Buddha used to say that life is just like a flame. You light a candle in the evening, and the whole night the candle burns. And you can see the flame almost the same, but it is not the same flame. The flame is becoming a smoke continuously, and new flame is coming out. The old is disappearing, and new is appearing. But the disappearance of the old and the appearance of the new is so quick that you cannot see the gap between the two. That's why you think it is the same flame. In the morning, when you will blow out the candle, never think you are blowing out the same candle that you had kindled in the evening. It is not. In these twelve hours the flame has continuously been changing. It is a flux. So is life. So is everything. Continuously changing, moving. Nothing is same. Nothing can remain the same for two consecutive moments. Once you understand that, but that understanding has to be first experienced in your own life flame. When you say your own life flame is a flux, a continuity of movement, move, movement a continuum, then everything around it is always new, similar, but new. And the moment you can feel your newness and everything's newness around you, boredom disappears. Animals are not bored, idiots are not bored, because they don't have the intelligence to see. Enlightened persons are not bored, because they can see the totality of their own being, that it is a constant newness. 
that dust does not gather there. The mirror remains clean. And everything that reflects in your consciousness is always new. The tree outside the house will not be the same in the morning. Please don't behave with the tree as if it is just the same. New leaves have come out, old leaves have fallen, new flowers may have blossomed, old flowers may have disappeared. Change is the only permanent phenomenon in existence. There is nothing else permanent except change. So what is there to be bored? But it has not to be just an intellectual understanding. It has to arise from your experience of being a flame. Exactly you are a flame which goes on changing. Every second something new is coming into the flame, something old is becoming a smoke. Once your aloneness becomes a constant newness, then whatever you do is creative, is original, is new. And you cannot manage in any way to feel bored. I have tried to feel bored at least one time more to see how it was. But I have to confess I could not succeed. Every way I have tried. But everything is so new what you can do. From where to bring something old? There is nothing old ever. All is new forever. But let this understanding arise from your innermost experience of aloneness.